Hello, welcome to our webinar, What Multilateralism Means at the Company Level. My name is Walter Reichman. I have the honor of moderating this webinar. And I thought I'd start by giving you some background on what we mean by multilateralism. Multilateralism from an international point of view means the coming together of a number of nations, usually three or more nations. And they have as a common goal, some enterprise, something they want to achieve, and they pledge to work together, to be together, to continue working together to solve a common problem. Multilateralism came to its fore at the end of the Second World War. The multilateralism led to the defeat of fascism, Nazism, and Imperial Japan. And it also led to the beginnings of the United Nations. The notion that a number of nations could come together, solve common problems, and in fact prevent another world war. The United Nations is now 75 years old. And certainly like every human developed organization, there are things that you can criticize about it and things that you can praise it for. And certainly the thing that you can praise it for is that it has prevented a third world war. There has not been a third world war in the 75 years since the beginning of the United Nations. It has also had a number of also tremendous uh, activities that it's done. Uh, it, it's created a whole bunch of new independent nations around the world. Uh, it has, uh, it re has reduced poverty by 50%. It has provided education and health and services to people around the world. Now in its 75th anniversary, the United Nations is experiencing a threat to the concept of multilateralism. There seems to be, in fact, there is a breakdown of nations wanting to come together and work together to solve common problems. And it's due to the increase in nationalism around the world, it's due to an increase of xenophobia, it's due to an increase of prejudices against people, against each other around this world. And there is a threat to the continuation of multilateralism. As a result of this, the Psychology Coalition at the United Nations, of which I am a member, had a meeting yesterday called UN 75, the multiculturalism we want, psychological contributions to building bridges among and within nations. It was attended by a thousand people around the world. There were four presenters who talked about the whole notion of multilateralism and what it means for the world. Business and industry, has been very much involved in the development of multilateralism. They have made major important contributions to the United Nations and to its development. Uh, they have been treaties to which they have signed, the principles, the guiding principles of business and human rights, the Organization for Economic Co Cooperation and Development, the Global Compact, which has an membership of 100, from 145 countries of 10,000 organizations around the world pledging to fulfill 10 principles that are promoted by the United Nations. Business organizations, certainly in this particular day, at this particular time, we are multinational, we are multilateral, we do businesses around the world. Based on what our philosophy is, based on the way we work, we have something to contribute to the notion of m maintaining multilateralism. What multilateralism means at the company level will be discussed in today's webinar. And the people who will be discussing it are from three major organizations in our country. We have a representative from PepsiCo, we have a representative from IBM, and we have a representative from Org Vitality. I'm going to introduce them each separately when they make their presentations. But I welcome you, I thank you for giving your time, for giving your efforts, and for sharing 
what multilateralism means for you and for your company. I'm gonna start with our first speaker who is from PepsiCo and she is Kira Barden. Kira is the Director of Global Talent Management and has the responsibility for leading the global performance management strategy for all of PepsiCo. In prior roles at PepsiCo, she had the responsibility for employee development. During that time, she had the responsibility of providing upward management feedback, the coaching program, and the global employee survey program. Prior to PepsiCo, Cura was on the global effectiveness team at Starwood Hotels and Resorts. Kira did her research in her graduate work in, psych in IO psychology at Baruch College of the City University of New York, and she is certified as a professional in human resources management from SHRM. Kira, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us today. Great. Thanks, Walter, for inviting me to present on today's webinar. Multilateralism is a critical topic to discuss, particularly in our current times as we face a global pandemic of the COVID-19 virus and as we see the rise of nationalism in many countries across the world, including our own. Some of the content I'll present is from a collaboration with Walter from a prior SIOP conference, and PepsiCo has since collected more data on the topic of company culture and country culture, and you'll see the results of five years of research that we've done um, in just a few minutes. For those of you who are not familiar with PepsiCo, we're a multinational food and beverages company with a strong portfolio of iconic brands. We are in more than 200 countries and territories, employing more than 260,000 employees. PepsiCo is like all organizations in that it's evolved over time. The mission and vision statements for the company as of 2018 are seen here. The PepsiCo way represents the leadership behaviors expected of all employees to ensure we win with purpose by being faster, stronger, and better as an organization. Global organizations are challenged to think about their structure and how to organize themselves. To keep up with the fast-paced market and ever-evolving business environment, it's essential for organizations to evolve over time. PepsiCo has undergone an organizational transformation in the last seven years. We've gone from being more siloed with functions and teams rolling centrally into one location known as polycentric to being more matrix where leaders lead a team of direct reports from multiple countries. They adhere to global policies and manufacture and distribute product lines across geographic boundaries, also known as being geocentric. When it comes to analyzing the impact of transformations and changes at an organization, there are a couple of different approaches one could take. There's two major bodies of research from Hofstede and Gerhardt to show different ways to understand the role of culture in employee survey research. Hofstede's research found a strong impact of the local culture when looking at employee survey data and that these cultural values impact employee behavior. On the other hand, Gerhardt argued that the stronger impact was the company's culture, exerting influence through policies, practices, and procedures, and therefore company culture would be stronger than the local culture. These two theories can be put to test as large organizations like PepsiCo examine employee survey data and can use this to interpret the findings. PepsiCo administers employee surveys on a regular basis to measure a variety of constructs. Historically, the Orc Health Survey has been used every other year as a large-scale global employee survey program in our organization. This survey was administered in the September and October timeframes in 2015, 2017, and 2019. And the analysis to look at the difference between company culture and country culture uses this Orc Health data from these three time periods. There are a variety of other tools that PepsiCo used to drive behavior change in the organization and to shape the culture, but for today's purposes, we'll be exclusively looking at org health data for four survey items across 10 countries. Two of those are in Latin America, four in Asia, three in Europe, and then in the United States, which is where our global headquarters are located. 
We compare these four survey items to country benchmark data from the Mayflower Group for the same or similar items to test our research question. So when we look at survey items on the four topics you see here, we took the average difference between PepsiCo employees in each of the 10 countries and compared it to the PepsiCo company average. This is what you see on the right-hand column of the table. And then we also took that same data and compared it to the country's benchmark score, which you see on the left-hand side of this table. If we look at the bottom for the average gap, in 2015, we saw the PepsiCo country data was closer to the country benchmark than it was to the PepsiCo company average by about 2.5 percentage points. Two years later, however, we saw nearly the same gap, but in the opposite direction, with more PepsiCo country data aligning to the company average than to the country benchmark. And then finally, two years later, which is five years from our original data point, PepsiCo data aligns closer to the company average than to the country benchmarks by about four points. Based on this data, one would hypothesize, um, using Gerhardt's theory, that we may find the gap lessening between country data and PepsiCo company overall scores over time. In the data we see here, the average gap or the difference between these 10 countries and PepsiCo's overall company score keeps shrinking over time. Let's fast forward now to 2020, and all countries around the world are now faced with uh, COVID-19, which has changed our world forever. The virus hit just after the last time PepsiCo administered the Org Health Survey in the fall of 2019. We decided to pulse our employees in April of this year to see how employees worldwide are faring in the pandemic. The survey presented a unique opportunity to look across the globe and measure employee perspectives on several topics and compare them to the infection rates tracked by the World Health Organization and the severity of COVID-19 in each of the countries at the time of our data collection. The brief survey included a question on energy. Specifically, I feel energized by my work. And this data represented 41,000 employees across the world. The red color coding on the global map shows us where energy has decreased from September 19 to April 2020. And this includes many major countries where PepsiCo does business. We see by the green shading where employees' energy levels increase during the same time. And it corresponds to many developing countries in the world. There's a lot more for multinational organizations like PepsiCo to learn through our organizational research as we navigate the pandemic and emerge into what the new normal looks like for our employees across the world. I want to wrap up by thanking Org Vitality for hosting this webinar as a follow-up to the United Nations Psychology Day yesterday. We face many challenges as individual people, as companies, and as countries. And the importance of coming together and taking shared responsibility for solutions can't be understated. We each do significant work in our respective roles and with the support of our organizations. And this work serves as the building blocks for a more unified world. So thank you for um, the invitation today, Walter, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kira. I appreciate your research. I appreciate your presentation. And I have to say something on a personal level that gives me a delight beyond, I guess, which I deserve. Kira was a student of mine many years ago. And the fact that she's doing so well, so important uh, in, in PepsiCo and presenting to the world her research and her experience is a very gratifying thing. So thank you very much, Kira. Thank you for agreeing. Thank you for being here. Okay, and I think a number of the things that you've said uh, really have generated something in my head. I'm going to save it for later on. But again, thank you very much, Kira. Uh, I'm going to present our next speaker, and his name is Paul Dommel. And Paul is director of IBM's Global Government Industry Organization. And since 2014, he has been the IBM Global Government Leader for Health and Human Services. Paul now heads the IBM Initiative on Mental Health, its implications for COVID, and the role of technology in providing new types of support to organizations and communities. He also leads IBM's Center for Excellence 
and works with clients and teams in the US, Latin America, Asia Pacific, and Europe. Paul has an MBA in international finance from the University of South Carolina. With such a range of responsibility, I thank you for taking time for sharing your wisdom, your research, and your experiences with us. Thank you so much, Paul. The floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Walter, very much. Uh, that is a really neat relationship between, uh, between you and Kira. So um, just a quick bit of background on IBM. Uh, we operate in 170 countries. We operate in every major industrial sector. We, uh, we focus in government and banking and finance and manufacturing. Uh, we have clients in consumer goods, retail, uh, pretty much everything. Um, our tran the transactions it, from a government perspective, um, you know, support social security, uh, unemployment payments, and income support payments for citizens around the world. And um, you know, we have a real focus on how it is that we that we serve citizens. So I'm focused on, um, I picked up a project last year that was really interesting, and it is uh, around the challenges of mental health. And it's a global issue. It's an issue for IBM. We have 350,000 employees. Uh, the vast majority of those employees are outside of the United States, uh, less than somewhere between 25 and 30 percent are inside the United States. So it's a, it's a global issue. And we work, um, we've worked some with the OECD, the World Economic Forum, um, the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, and a number of uh, private sector business roundtables, and, and actually the American Heart Association, who's interested in mental health because of the impact on, on heart disease, to really inform our thinking. And then, of course, as a technology company, we're really interested in the role of technology in making a difference. So just a, a quick overview on, on why mental health. Um, it costs the global economy over two, a trillion dollars a year uh, in lost productivity. Um, and I saw that actually on almost my first day in IBM about 20 years ago. When I joined, um, we started working right away on this, uh, on this giant proposal. And the proposal manager um, um, one day didn't show up for work. And uh, we heard from his wife that he had had a heart attack. Years later, I found out that, um, that he had had a breakdown. Uh, so that breakdown, um, which he recovered from and came back to work and was all was all good, but it but it cost it cost us two months of time of a really valuable person, of a leader in the company, of a person that was helping us to uh, to you know understand a client issue and go and win work, and it's that loss of productivity that shows up um, bit by bit in that trillion dollars of of global economic impact. And you look at the numbers, I've learned that 40% of employees have had a mental health issue at some point in their career. But the majority of them, almost two thirds, will never talk about it with their employer. So it's the same issue with, um, with, that, with that guy that I worked with. Uh, it was a big secret. Um, other reasons for mental health, su uh, suicide rates are trending up. Uh, we're seeing loneliness and aging, and this is particularly an issue uh, as we think about COVID-19 and what's happening right now with COVID-19. In the last economic downturn, there was uh, a double-digit increase that was attributed to loss of jobs, double-digit increase in the suicide rate. So um, this downturn, which is going to be uh, much sharper and probably longer, uh, it's going to have a real impact on that. And we see traces of that already. There's a thousand percent increase in people calling into mental health and suicide hotlines. So it's a, it's a big issue. And it's a big issue for IBM itself. Uh, we have 
our HR team is really engaged on this. And when we think about what we're doing for COVID, um, you know, it's very much, in, it's very much um, internally as a company with our employees, there are resources for people to go to, there's um, um, uh, discussions for managers about how they should handle staff and making sure that everybody is uh, reaching out to each other. Um, so it's a it's it's a big deal. And from a company perspective, we've been really active in this space. We are a member of the corporate roundtable that's focused on this. A big piece of some collaboration with the American Heart Association. I was involved um, last year with an OECD project uh, working with the World Economic Forum and actually the AARP. And it was around some of the issues of getting um, older workers uh, um, interested in re-engaging in the workforce. And there are a lot of uh, kind of mental fitness aspects of that conversation. And IBM was the first wave of signatories to a 2019. So in November of last year, a presidential task force that was really focused on uh, mental health and suicide prevention. And IBM was, one of, was the first day of, of signatories around, this is a baseline of support and services that you know, we commit to uh, for our employees. One of the things that we did actually was really uh, neat. We partnered uh, and um, were hired and partnered by an organization called uh, Give an Hour. And they asked us to help them to have a global conversation around how to change the culture of mental health. So um, we worked with them. We, there were about 2,000 people that signed up um, from around 20 countries around the world. And basically, uh, there were uh, 32 hours of just constant global online conversation around education and suicide rates and culture and access barriers and, and work environment. It was an amazing group of people. Um, we had leaders from government. We had um, uh, Academy Award winners were, were part of it, uh, a recipient of Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, singers, entertainers, generals, um, celebrities, uh, mental health advocates, and people from the academic world. Really sort of spinning, talking about changing, uh, throwing out ideas on, on mental health. And the results were really um, not surprising. Res resources, if you, the, it was interesting in the end, I think, uh, there were thousands of comments. It was much larger than the, you know, the, the content was much larger than, um, than the average American novel. Um, but some of the things that really came away with, resources are scarce. Stigma is a, is a major issue. So the issue with the, um, you know, my, my peer that left, um, that left IBM for a while. And interestingly, communities and collaboration are important. So, you know, that began to inform some of our thinking around what technology looks like and what it is that, uh, what kind of role technology has in, um, in, in making a difference. And uh, probably until now, there are two types of technology for mental health, uh, both continue to be critically important. The first one is a patient record. Uh, so a doctor or a therapist is, is tracking a patient's progress. The other is how do I bill for that time? Um, but what we learned, I think, from the jam was was interesting and informed our thinking. Um, and so we started to think around um, how do we um, uh, do a better job of getting people in touch with the resources that they need. So we've got a um, there's a solution called Here For You. It's basically using some artificial intelligence to think about, um, to ask, to answer questions of where do I go for help? And maybe if I'm having an issue, what are the, what are the type of things that I should be doing? And interestingly, where this is getting the most pickup and traction is on university campuses where it's really unlikely maybe that the first thing that a person is going to do is jump on their, if they're having an issue, is jump on their device and figure out what to do. But the people that do care are the professors 
uh, and that person's friends. And so it's a, you know, that kind of capability to reach out, where do, I, uh, where do I go for help? It's a really big deal. Another, um, uh, so another solution uh, is around this uh, concept of, of mental fitness. Um, and, and it's just an example of solutions, not an IBM ad. Um, but it's really to transition, to smooth the transition of people from the military to civilian life. So um, we put together, we, and the issue is uh, high suicide rates among veterans, uh, new veterans. And in particular, the suicide rate is especially high among uh, women coming out of the military into civilian life. So we worked with a couple of companies, uh, one on mental health assessments uh, to put into to put into a device or a tool, um, and the other and included some exercises and and things to do. Uh, but we also what the key stressor is. All right, I've been in the military. What am I going to do when I get out? So um, worked using technology to work on job search and really cool stuff to identify. Um, where there are uh, jobs that a person would be most eligible for. So if you're a military veteran, use some artificial intelligence to say, okay, if I was, if I was fixing tanks, um, you know, what are the occupations? And then match it with, um, in a normal world, uh, there are 200,000 new job openings every single day in the U.S., so using artificial intelligence to match that person's interests, capabilities uh, in each one of these new 200,000 jobs. The other area, and we talked about it, came out of the jam, was the idea of community. Um, so we're, um, another example of some, uh, a technology type is uh, for people to create a single view of an individual as people are working with different uh, government entities, the most vulnerable citizens in our population. So um, somebody comes out of prison in uh, Sonoma County, they work with, as an example, in Sonoma County in California, they work with a parole officer, they work with employment, they work with housing, they'll work with maybe mental health or opiate addiction services. Uh, and so technology to create a single view of that individual with permission and security um, of, e what's, of how each one of those people is interacting with that individual so that they can do a better job of collaborating in real time as they're working with the person. They'll understand, they'll, you know, the, the mental health person will be able to understand how housing and employment are working with the person and how that person is doing. So um, we've also published a great deal of work in the role of mental health and technology. Uh, these are pretty good pieces of work. They're available publicly. Um, an example, you know, we did write up the jam. And if anybody's interested in any more information about that, there's a great write up just sort of talking about the jam relates it to the world of COVID. Um, also, um, some pretty good reports on loneliness and aging. And, and again, some reports on uh, the role of technology in providing access to uh, mental health resources. So uh, with that, Walter, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Paul. I am actually totally overwhelmed by your presentation. It resonates with me on so many different levels. I have little pieces of things to say, uh, I'm going to just take a moment and hopefully we'll get, have time to get back to it later. You know, I do work with the United Nations and they did a survey in 2015 and they found that 49% of people who work for the United Nations around the world indicate on a survey that they have serious mental health problems with major depression being one of, one of the biggest ones of all. The other piece of information was that the longer they were employed at the UN, the greater the likelihood that they were having mental health problems. And, you know, uh, Jeff and I did a webinar a few months ago on mental health. And what we know is that there are, some in the, there are some things in the workplace itself 
that contribute to mental health problems. And, and the identification of that, those activities within the UN and, and the, um, the, the ability to get this total picture of the person as they relate to their job and to do this from technology, which again, way beyond my ability to even think about is, is you know, ha has such enormous and fantastic potential, you know, for the future. So it was so great. Uh, I have a bunch of other little things running around in my head. Um, I, I learned about a company in the Netherlands, uh, in w it, was a, it was a successful company in which 50% of the employees were diagnosed schizophrenics. They purposely went out to employ schizophrenics. And through the process of working with these people in the company, they had people working, making a living, and a successful company beyond that. So th there is so much potential in everything that you said, and certainly what we certainly know, as you pointed out, uh, what's gonna be happening at the end of this COVID-19 epidemic, parademic, uh, it, it's gonna be terrible in terms of mental health, as you pointed out. So thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I'm gonna get all of those papers that you talked about. This is a major interest of mine as well. So thank you so much. Continue the work here. I think you're helping to save the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I am delighted to present our third speaker, Jeff Saltzman. Uh, Jeff is the CEO of my company. I have worked with him for 20 years uh, and it has been a delight, a growth experience, a developmental experience for me. And uh, I am delighted that he was willing to share his thinking, uh, his mode of operation uh, with, with the public as part of, of this webinar. Uh, so Jeff Saltzman is the CEO of Org Vitality, and he is an associate fellow at the Center for Leadership Studies of the School of Management at Binghamton University. As an organizational psychology, he has worked as a consultant in industry, finance, retail, media, technology, not-for-profits, government agencies, all on how to improve their organizational performance and organizational effectiveness. He has worked extensively in New York, Europe, Latin America, and Asia Pacific. As the founder and CEO of Org Vitality, he has advised dozens of multinational companies who are clients of us. He is the author of many books and many chapters, among them, Creating the Vital Organization, Balancing Short-Term Profits and Long-Term Success with another partner, Scott Brooks. As the partner in Org Vitality, I am delighted to give the floor to my CEO, Jeff Saltzman. Thank you, Walter, and uh, hi, everybody. Welcome uh, to our uh, continuation of the UN Psychology Day discussion. Um, you know, yesterday's uh, UN session dealt with the threat uh, that multilateralism is facing uh, in today's world. You know, the rise of populism, xenophobia, racism is rearing its head uh, higher than it's uh, been recently. And there are those who exploit uh, these tendencies uh, to gather power among themselves. And so multilateralism is under threat. What I'd, I'd like to do uh, is just take a moment to define multilateralism in, in a way that fits with this uh, particular presentation. So uh, let me take a step back. So multilateralism uh, is when three or more entities come together to pursue common goals, right? Let's contrast that briefly to bilateralism, you know, if two groups are working together for a common uh, goal, or unilateralism, when one entity just pursues its own agenda by itself. Uh, there's a number of uh, variations on that, by the way. Multilateralism doesn't mean that the entities are similar in size or intent, for instance. And so there's variations on that. A number of smaller entities, for instance, could band together to influence a larger entity. Uh, or a larger entity, uh, by reaching agreement with other smaller entities, may in be able to influence a similarly large entity. So, but the idea of multilateralism is that these multiple groups are working together towards some kind of common goal. So how does that uh, play out in a, in a uh, organization, 
right? And let's see if some of you can recognize a few of these things. So if you talk about uh, three or more entities uh, banding together to pursue common goals, uh, you know, you, you often have sales, finance, engineering, manufacturing, you know, working together to heat, to achieve year end or yearly targets for a particular uh, company. Bilateralism may be uh, marketing and sales setting goals without consulting manufacturing. We want to sell so many widgets, can you make them? And they don't bother, you know, checking. Uh, of course, that never happens, right? And unilateralism might be something like engineering uh, designs products without first discussing with manufacturing what it takes to actually, you know, build those products. Uh, sometimes, you know, engineering will design a product and throw it over the wall, sort of almost defying manufacturing. Let's see if you can make this uh, sort of as a sense of pride and, and how sophisticated their engineering is. Uh, and finally, you, know, you can have a number of smaller departments that uh, group together uh, to try and influence the C-suite, for instance. Um, but think about uh, under which conditions a higher degree of cooperation would be found within a company and under which conditions the company is likely to be more successful. So let's, let's take a quick look at some data. Uh, this is uh, org vitality uh, client-based norms, right? So first, look on the left side. We've, I've split the, these norms into uh, two big groupings. On the left side, what you have is within department or within work group norms. So for instance, people in my work group support one another in the work we do, you know, 87% favorable. People tend to be very positive towards their immediate work group and the work they uh, they do and, and that there's a high degree of uh, cooperation, teamwork likewise. Departments in our work unit work well together, 81%. But then notice as you move over to the right-hand side, when you start looking across departments or across work groups, in general, there's about a 20-point drop in the percent favorable, right? So other work groups gives us the support we need to succeed or departments within the company work collaboratively in the best interest in the company overall. It's not that these results are horribly negative, but when you compare it to the within department norms, you see a markedly and a consistent drop off uh, for those kinds of, of organizations. So even in the best of companies, right? And, the, and this is, these are norms from across you know, hundreds of organizations. Even in the best of companies, it's easier to be not be multilateral, right? Not to work across departments or bring in uh, uh, different groups to achieve common company goals. It's not that it's not happening, it's just more difficult than being more insular and working within a group. And that's the discrepancy we see uh, in the normative data. Um, but let's, let's go back in time uh, now. And what are the, the origins of multilateralism, this idea of different groups have to work together. Uh, where did this come from? Uh, Professor Walter Scheidel uh, writes about what he calls the four horsemen, right, of major economic leveling. He cites them as mass mobilization, warfare, transformative revolution, state collapse, and, and uh, plagues. Uh, pandemics, or the threat of them, as it turns out, have been the drivers of societal change for millennium. So for instance, think about the bubonic plague, also called the Black Death, Black Death that raged in Europe starting in 1347. One third to one half of the population in Europe perished. Uh, this greatly diminished the workforce and this greatly diminished workforce had more leverage over their feudal masters and it was the beginning of collective bargaining. This collective bargain, bargaining led to higher wages, better quality of life for peasants, but nobles and landlords found it hard to maintain their extravagant lifestyles when they had to pay higher wages, and so they resisted. They got laws passed uh, to keep wages low and even to tie workers to the land in which they lived. There were rebellions, they were put down, uh, but in the end, these laws were not enforced because the workforce could and simply did move on to other locations that maybe paid them a little bit better and uh, this brought, eventually, this brought about the end of the feudal system. So multilateralism has a long, long history, right? And the diseases that you saw back then uh, were the start of the reasons for multilateralism to occur. 
quarantine and other social distancing practices, for instance, date back to the 14th century in Europe and earlier, and by the 19th century, the spread of economic or epidemic diseases emerged as a problem that required an international coordinated response. Smallpox and other diseases came to the Americas and Africa, decimating the indigenous population at the start of European colonialism. And the Europeans themselves encountered new diseases such as malaria uh, in warmer climates. By the end of the 18th century, these ad hoc and uncoordinated quarantines of ships at ports uh, by European powers was, it was their attempt to stem the tide of these epidemic diseases that were uh, running through uh, uh, the land. Um, however, and, and of course, millions of people died in both Europe and India uh, from these epidemic. But these ad hoc quarantines were not very effective. Each country sort of going their own way and doing their own thing did not lead to the desired outcome. So from 1851 to 1938, there were actually 14 international conferences held to standardize and to coordinate regulations around court, uh, quarantines, how to quarantine ships and so forth as uh, international uh, trade uh, occurred. And this was in response to the plague that was going on, cholera and yellow fever. These regulations sought to maximize protection from disease with minimum effect on trade and travel due to massive economic threats that the disease posed to global trade. The imposition of these regulations also led to increases as we're seeing now to xenophobia and racial discrimination. So this idea of multilateralism and, and has in, in its roots, sort of if you go way back in time, a, a response to uh, medical threats, to uh, threats because of disease, right? And so here we are, right? Here we are in this moment again, right? The question is though, uh, can corporations of any kind, for, uh, for that matter, go it alone? Or do we need to band together to coordinate activity to successfully overcome a worldwide pandemic or other future challenges we're bound to face? For instance, supply chains are intertwined and global, and that's not changing. As our customers and people move around, as they have always done, you know, humans as a species have itchy feet. We travel, we explore, we move, right? But today, the difference is we move around with, sp with speed. We're in a period where one infected person can get on a plane and shortly thereafter, we have 500,000 deaths globally. Additionally, a chasm is open between those who are able to conduct their business remotely uh, and are potentially less likely to lose their, lose their jobs and others who are either at the mercy of short-term relief programs or face greater risk of viral exposure in many of the jobs that remain. African Americans and other minorities face higher rates of the disease incident as well as mortality. Some of this is due to higher percentage who have frontline work. They're simply out there. Uh, they're being exposed more. And some of it is due to economic conditions, leading to differential access to health, health care and crowded housing. Economic disparity also affects students as well, with some struggling to participate in online education because their households lack the necessary resources, such as computers, broadband access, as well as space to work and study. In a pandemic uh, with an easily spread disease and no viable treatment, at least not yet, um, it becomes clear that health and healthcare, in order to have a functioning society, is a society level need, a public health need and not an individual choice. Or if one person has the disease, it can spread to all people, right? So where do we go, right? How do you, from a multilateral standpoint, how do you begin to tackle some of these things? And by the way, it would be a mistake to think of COVID-19 as a one-off event. It's simply the current challenge that we humans are facing. Will there be another equally or larger challenge that we need to band together to successfully overcome? Of course, right? We're already facing one. It's called climate change. It has the potential to create misery that will make COVID-19 seem like a walk in the park. Misery and discontent could rise to the extent that makes radical departures from the status quo inevitable. Wars over water, access to livable environments are bound to break out. New diseases will emerge as the environment changes. 
One thing that COVID has made abundantly clear in our interconnected world is in fact that we are interconnected. The main part of preparedness to, these, uh, to face these events is that we need as humans to begin to realize we're all in this together. Uh, that what affects one person anywhere affects everyone everywhere. And that we're therefore inevitably, inevitably part of a species and we need to think that way rather than to think about divisions of race, ethnicity, as ethnicity or economic status. We're all drinking out of the same straw, which is inserted into Mother Earth. And once that well is poisoned, it's poisoned for all of us. Now, if we go back to the company, what, you, what we have to think of is what we have to think we have to work together as a human species, be organized to care for one another, another to realize that the health of the most vulnerable people among us is the determining factor of the health of all of us. And if we aren't prepared to do that, we will never ever be prepared to confront the challenges that we're gonna face in the future. You know, companies are not islands separated from the rest of society. They are embedded within society. Even the largest corporations have been brought to their knees by this global pandemic. Uh, the reason for this is that their constituents their employees, their customers, suppliers, investors, communi communities in which they're located, they've all been impacted. Nobody has not been touched by this. Companies that take a multilateral approach working across the spectrum of their constituencies will become stronger than those who don't. In a globally collected world, no one can go it alone, not a government, not a company, not an individual. In a globally connected world where one individual can spark a pandemic, the most vulnerable among us will determine our fates. The challenges uh, to obtain multilateral, multilateral cooperation are great, especially in this age of unilateralism, where divisions, old stereotypes, and fears are exploited to gather power and wealth, but there really is no choice. There's only so much road available to kick that can down. So where to? Some of the problems we face today can only be solved by multiple companies working jointly to solve them. For instance, electric vehicles are one example where companies are voluntarily jointly working together, largely due to cost and technology issues. Other companies are adhering to the plant, uh, Paris Climate Accords, reducing emis emissions and operating in a sustainable fashion, regardless of what the political powers in the United States are doing. Importantly, other companies will operate in a sustainable fashion or with the consumer's best interests in mind only under a regulatory regimen. You cannot guarantee that everyone will operate the way they should be simply because of some kind of moral uh, fabric that they obtain. It has to be monitored and it has to be enforced. We're entering a period post COVID where there's opportunity to examine, maybe a requirement to examine, the ways society and organizations within society operate. Let me give the last word to uh, Jamie Dimon, where the other day uh, he had his meeting with his shareholders and in that meeting he said, it's my fervent hope that we use this crisis as a catalyst to rebuild an economy that creates and sustains opportunity for dramatically more people, especially those who've been left behind for far too long. Thank you. And with that, let me turn it back over to Walter. Wow. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, you've framed it in a global way, in a meaningful way. And I, I thank you for the thought that went into this and for your organization of your thinking for this great presentation. Um, would you please stay on? Uh, Kira and Paul, would you please get on as well? Um, we have a few minutes for a, a, a brief discussion, and I'm going to challenge you um, by asking you a question for which I don't have the answer. But let's just say that the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Mr. Guterres, was watching this session, and he said, I now understand in a different way what problem is with multilateralism. I understand what each of these organizations and what, what each of these people have done to promote multilateralism. Now help me out. I have 193 
member nations of the UN, each independent, making their own decisions. I am threatened by many of these organizations, many of these countries, because of the nationalism, the xenophobia, and so forth. Advise me, gentlemen and lady, what can I do as the Secretary General of the United Nations to promote multilateralism and counteract all of the issues that is inhibiting it? Who would like to start with this? My million dollar question. <laughs> I can go ahead and start. Uh, and go ahead, Kira. Um, so I, I would say that um, obviously um, working with countries and governments is very important, but I think what we have seen through these presentations is that um, multinational companies have a very big uh, role to play in the world. And, uh, you know, given the interest that they have in their employees and, um, you know, products across the, uh, the world, that they're also an important stakeholder. And so I think about some of the things that like PepsiCo has done, for example, with uh, United Nations General Assembly coming up with the sustainability goals. And so we've aligned our sustainability uh, agenda for the organization to those goals and talk about our progress to our stakeholders through the um, you know, annual sustainability report, for example. So it's holding ourselves accountable and yet working, um, you know, with many other organizations to, tr to try to move in that same direction of what the UN is trying to achieve. Okay, great. Is there anything that you would tell Mr. Guterres to do? Should he bring you into this process, bring PepsiCo and other similar organizations into this process? I, th I think we've seen that many uh, of our, you know, CEOs of our large organizations have, you know, as much power in many cases than some of our government leaders. Okay. So perhaps give more power to the UN from the people who are the leaders of your organization. By I, would, with it. I, would, I would add to what Kira said in that I've seen the analysis she's done uh, in my career a couple times. Uh, and, you know, each time you look at it, you're like, is it going to come out the same way? Is it going to come out the same way? And each time it has come out the same way in terms of the bottom line is that these companies have more effect in determining what a, the local operating culture of that company is beyond what the local culture is, right? In other words, no, because we're not asking about, and we're not looking at uh, things like, um, you know, at what age should people get married, or, you know, what are the common religious practice. You know, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the world of work, and when it comes to the world of work, these companies can have a lot of influence on the local culture of these uh, countries in terms of the world of work. I'm not getting into other things. And so if a company says in the world of work, we're going to treat all people equitably and fairly and not discriminate, that will begin to permeate that company's culture. Likewise, if in the world of work, the company says we're going to operate in a healthy, sustainable fashion, that will begin to uh, permeate as well. And so I think if the companies from a multilateral standpoint got together and said, here are common principles by which we're going to operate in a global fashion, I think we can begin to move the dial. There's, there's one body of research I just want to mention quickly on this. And it had to do, um, the research I, I will quote had to do with voting. Um, and it had to do with how do you get people to actually participate in the behavior you want them to participate in. And there was the study that was done said, um, can you get a commitment from someone to say, I will vote in the next election, right? Will that drive a higher participation in a turnout for an election, right? To get that commitment from them. But alternatively, the, the other condition was to get people to, def not to tie it to a specific election, but to get people to define themselves as a voter. In other words, part of who I am is I am a voter. And then it's not tied to any specific uh, uh, event or activity, but rather it's how they define themselves. So what we have to do is 
And this would work at the individual level. I think it would work at the com company level, although certainly more research needs to be done. How do these companies define themselves in a way that is good for us as humanity and good for this planet? Uh, and I, I think that's where the direction I would push in. So I, I went on, so let me turn it off. Great, great, I, I won't comment now. Paul, give me your viewpoint. We, we have a few minutes left, but I must hear your viewpoint. You are certainly multilateral and multi-influential in all the things that you're doing. What would you advise our Secretary General? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, multinational corporations, whether they're U.S. based or based, uh, based somewhere else, are, have a natural affinity for um, organizations and entities that are working to create level playing fields uh, where we can, everybody can operate with a consistent set of ethical standards and, and practices. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in every, inside of a country and inside of the UN, there's millions and millions, there's tons of stakeholders. But I think that uh, business is a, a natural ally in, you know, working multinationally uh, with these organizations because that's who we are and that's, that's, that's how we live. And, you know, both Kira and I work for uh, companies that have offices in well over a hundred countries. Uh, it's at the core and the fabric of, of, of who we are, really. I, I'm so we're a voice. We're a voice, but we're not any more powerful than other voices. I, I want to pick up on that and something that both Kira said and that Jeff said. Uh, Jeff, uh, well, Kira pointed out that as time goes on, uh, people are becoming more like the dominant organization, the culture of the dominant organization. Um, Jeff then talked about the definition of oneself. And I'm, I'm wondering, I'm kind of free associating, as organizations become more multilateral, as employees adapt to the culture of the home organization, will that have an effect on the changes of people as they define themselves, as their personalities evolve and change? Will this come to a time when we will all define ourselves and perceive ourselves in very much the same way? And will that be an effect of the work of organizations? And then perhaps maybe as we define ourselves and see, see ourselves in much the same way, there'll be less of a movement toward nationalism, toward xenophobia, toward prejudice. I'm kind of free associating at that point. Uh, any comment from my colleagues? Well, by, by the way, I, I, I think, you know, there's been a whole industry and a whole um, research effort that always looks for differences. Uh, and I think we would be much better served if rather than constantly searching for what differentiates, what are the differences between people, that we started looking at how are we similar? Uh, because I think our similarities are much, much greater than our differences. You know, that's uh, great. One of the points that was made yesterday by Professor yes. Mohagdam was that we should begin to teach the similarities, not the differences, that diversity and multiculturalism to take a back seat to the similarities among the people, which are much greater. And that would be a way of, of reducing uh, this kind of anti-multilateralism. And I, I really like yesterday, they talked about the diary technique, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And I, as soon as I heard that, I started thinking about how cool would it be if every day the New York Times published 100 people's diaries of people from around the world about what they're doing uh, that day, how they spend their time. And what you begin to see is, you know what? Everybody's doing more or less the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And that's also true among groups of people within a country as well. So that you think uh, that the people who are living in Harlem are spending their day much differently than the people who are living in Scarsdale. It isn't that much of a difference on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and that kind of a diary would work. But we've come to the end of our time. I thank you all for participating, for your wisdom, for your 
sharing your wisdom with us. And just want to say that if you have any questions, send in your questions. We will respond to them. Uh, this will be recorded and you will be able to get a recording. Just, you know, send a, a, an email to, to us. And there will be a survey after this. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you'd give us some feedback on this session. I thank you all very, very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Stay healthy, stay well. And let's work for our common goal of making this a multilateral world uh, in which we're all healthy, productive, and achieve for the benefit of the world. Thank you again, and have a good day. Thank you to the audience for participating. Uh, we are very happy that you were here. Thank you, Walter. Take care. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.